turn to Galatians chapter 1. Begin reading at verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither when I went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. We'll stop there. And I would ask you to turn to Acts 15. And before we look at some of the verses in this chapter, just to kind of give you an overview, uh, there were some, some in the churches in Galatia who sought to trouble the Galatians by perverting the gospel. They were not content with the gospel message that salvation was by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. They were not content with that message, but they felt the need to add to it by perverting the gospel. They felt the need to perfect their salvation by the works of the law, making circumcision necessary as a means of salvation. Here in Acts 15, we see those that were teaching such things. Uh, here in the very first verse, we see that there were certain men in Acts 15, verse 1, that there were certain men which came down from Judea that taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they were saying that if you were not circumcised, then you are not saved. So do you see, as we've been pointing this out, uh, through as we've been going through Galatians, but it's quite clear here. But do you see how they are perverting the gospel? Unless you be circumcised, you cannot be saved. So they were perverting the way of salvation, and they were adding to it with the works of the law. When therefore Paul and Barnabas uh, had, uh, when therefore Paul and Barnabas in verse two, chapter fifteen, had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and the elders about this question. So here in chapter fifteen of Acts, this is the council of Jerusalem because there are those that were teaching this false gospel, this false way. They're perverting the gospel. We have the council in Jerusalem between the apostles, uh, and they they reasoned these things out, and they all came into an agreement. Uh, but when Paul and Barnabas came up to Jerusalem, we see in verse five that again there were some there of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses, that the Gentiles had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. So this was prevalent in the, in the beginning of uh, the church in that first century. In these early days, it was prevalent all over. And it was even coming, it was actually coming out of Jerusalem. So Paul and Barnabas, they go up to Jerusalem, then they have this meeting with the apostles. It says in verse 6 of chapter 15 that the apostles and the elders came together, together to consider this matter. And then Peter, he, he stands up and he speaks about this when there is a, a much debate. In verse 9, we see that uh, in verse 10, we see that Peter says, Now therefore, why tempt you God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So here Peter says that this tradition that has been handed down, that has even been given to us from Moses and the law, was, was a burden in itself. That the, there was never salvation by the means of circumcision. Circumcision was always an outward sign of what God does in the inward man when God circumcises the heart. But he tells them, why would you put a yoke upon the disciples, which neither our fathers could bear? This never saved them, and nor can it save us, and nor does it save the Gentiles. And so they came to an agreement in this. And then also, 
James speaks up and he says in verse 19, in this council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, James says, Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Here the way of salvation has been preached to them, the gospel has been preached, and it has been received, but now there's some that come in to trouble the Gentiles by perverting the gospel, by adding circumcision as a means of salvation. These Gentiles that have been turned to God are being troubled by these false teachers and by these false apostles with a false gospel. And so James says, uh, we trouble them not, that we should trouble them not. We should not add this yoke upon them, a yoke that they cannot bear. And then James says in verse 24 of chapter 15, for as much as we have heard that certain which, certain which went out from us have troubled you with words. So this is actually a letter that they are writing to the Gentiles. And in the letter, James writes, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we, have, we gave no such commandment. So those actually that were teaching these things came out of Jerusalem, came out from among James and the other apostles, though they were not sent by them, they came from them. They were false ones that came out from, from them. And so James is correcting this and he's saying, they are not, we, we did not command them and they're actually subverting your souls with this false gospel to keep the law and to be circumcised. So they're exposing them and exposing this false, uh, this false gospel. And so James says, it seemed good unto us. He writes, it seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnas, Barnabas and Paul. So the same thing we're dealing with here in Galatians was the same thing that they were dealing with, uh, with in Jerusalem and that Paul had to address everywhere he went. There were those that were adding the works of the law and circumcision as a means of salvation. And the point I want to make here is that they were saying you must be circumcised to be saved. They were perverting the way of salvation. And therefore, it was heresy. It was false. And those that would preach such things were, uh, had a curse pronounced upon them. Let them be a curse was Paul's response. And the reason I want to make this point is because they are perverting the way of salvation. Now, we know that among the churches and among brethren, they can, there can be differences of opinions of how we may walk circumspectly, how we may uh, please God in the things that we do. One man doeth a thing unto the Lord, and one man doeth not a thing unto the Lord. One man um, honoreth the day unto the Lord, and one man honoreth not to the Lord. But they both do it unto the Lord. So there are differences that we may have an opinion, but when it comes to the way of salvation, every Christian has to hold on to the same truth, has to believe the same things. We cannot be different on what we believe as a means and as a way of salvation. But let's not uh, take that and say, okay, those that preach a false gospel, let them be accursed. And this man that I differ on something that's a secondary issue, let's not pronounce a curse upon them. Let's have grace one with another in those things. But we must keep our eyes and our ears uh, attentive to the, what are they saying about the way of salvation? How is one saved? And that is what is being assaulted by these false teachers. And then we also saw last week that the reason many Jews reverted back to the old covenant was because of the fear and the pressure of men. It was because of the tradition of men that was handed down generation from generation. And so the reason those, they had these false teachers that were teaching these things, then Jews would revert back to the old covenant because they had the tradition of men. And the fear of men weighed upon them, so they gave in to these false teachings. But Paul, and we thank God for Paul because Paul received the gospel, which was not handed to him from men. It was, it was given to him directly from Jesus Christ. He received by the revelation of Jesus Christ directly the gospel, which was given to him, which is the same gospel that the apostles were given. And it's the same gospel that they preached. And it's the same gospel that, that has been given to us, which is, it comes directly from God. And though uh, Paul received this gospel directly from God when he was born again, he had not always received this gospel. He had in himself a zeal for the tradition of his fathers. Though Paul had not always known the glorious good news of Jesus Christ, he was zealous for the very things that these false teachers were teaching. He could say to the heretics in, in the church, these false teachers, you think you have a right to boast in the flesh? Well, I mourn. 
He says in Philippians chapter 3, in verse 4 through 6, he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Concerning those that were holding on to the, the tradition of, of men, Paul says that he had more confidence than them in the flesh because he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. He could say to them, you think you have zeal. Well, he himself, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So Paul knew all too well what these false teachers were teaching and what they were uh, bringing the others, the other Gentiles and the others that were swayed by their teaching into. He knew that these things were a curse because he, he knew all too well these were the things that he followed after with so much zeal and everything that he had, but he knew that it was profitless. It all was vain. None of it profited him in anything when it comes to salvation, when it comes to spiritually pleasing the Lord. He could say, look at where my zeal led me, Concern, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. In all of his zeal, he was still persecuting the God he claimed to serve because of his, the wickedness of his heart. These traditions and, and the, this law, with his wicked heart, only, uh, only made him more wicked. He says in our passage, in the passage we just read in Galatians, for you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church and wasted it. It is no secret. He, he didn't, he's telling them this, that you have heard of my conversation. They have all heard of Paul's ways before he was saved. He, they were all afraid of him, and they wanted to hide from him because they knew what he was about when he was persecuting the church. They all even fled to other cities, all but the apostles, in that time of Paul persecuting the church. In Acts 8.3, we read about Saul. This was before was, Paul was converted. It says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling men and women and committing them into prison. This is what he did in his blind zeal, thinking that he was serving God he was actually leading his children and hauling them into prison and even sentencing them to death. So the tradition of his fathers, the zeal that he had, profited him nothing, but he was actually persecuting the God he claimed to serve. But we do read in Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 12 and 13, uh, Paul, even again, speaking about who he was, first he says, And I thank God, Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Then he says, But I obtained it, or but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. You think about the zeal that he has. I keep saying that it was a blind zeal because. It was a zeal that was only according to his flesh, according to what he thought was right. He thought he was serving God, but really he was persecuting God and his church. And so he was doing it ignorantly. When the gospel came to Paul on the road to Damascus in the, in the person of Jesus Christ, Paul's eyes were blinded physically, but his heart was opened. He was able to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now God revealed himself to Paul in Jesus Christ, in mercy. He obtained mercy, not because he earned it. As when we look at Paul's life, we know that Paul was doing everything but earn salvation. He could not earn it. He was going about to establish his own righteousness, but it was in vain. He himself, in this passage in 1 Timothy, calls himself the, the, uh, the chief of sinners, God's grace was poured out abundantly upon Paul. And God's grace is unmerited favor. God chooses whom he pours out his grace upon. Paul never forgot the pit from whence he was dug out of. He never forgot those things that he did. But in one sense, he did forget in that he pressed forward. He pressed forward into knowing Christ, into growing in Christ, and and so he didn't let those things that he had done in the past hold him down. And he, he, he also let those things go in the past that he never reverted back to them. 
as some of the Jews has reverted, they have reverted back to the old ways after they have received the gospel. Again in 1 Timothy 1, chapter, or, uh, verses 14 through 17, right after the verse I just read, Paul says, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might, might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should, which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul is an example of God's grace and mercy. He's a vessel of God's mercy and he is an example and a pattern to all that would believe on the name of Jesus Christ, unto life everlasting. He's a pattern of God's long suffering. God long suffered with, with the apostles Paul, before he was the apostle Paul, with Saul's wickedness, with his, rebe with his rebellion, and even persecuting his own. God long suffered that. He suffered long. And that was a pattern unto all that would believe, that none of us obtain salvation by works, by our own righteousness, but it is all of grace. It is, it is all of mercy, and it's according to God's good pleasure. And so Paul is a pattern to, to all of us that would believe. Romans eleven six says, as Paul is talking about the remnant uh, according to the Election of grace in chapter 11, Romans 11, he's, he says this, he says, speaking of, of grace, he said, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. When speaking about the way of salvation and how we are saved, we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. All of our salvation is complete, and it is full in Jesus Christ, in the person, in the work of Jesus Christ. Anyone that would add to it is perverting the gospel of Christ. And if we are to add to our works, then it is no more of grace. It is of works, and therefore we are responsible for earning and keeping our salvation, which that is not possible. We came into the gospel by the grace of God, realizing our sin, realizing that we are fallen, that we are condemned, that we are guilty under the law. It takes a sinner to see his sin in order to cry out for a savior, cry out for mercy. When God brings us in to that grace, let us never go back to trying to earn our own salvation, trying to keep ourselves. Only God can keep us. It is the gospel that saves us, and it is the gospel that keeps us. Verse 15 in Galatians 1. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Paul was called by God before he was even born. We see this, this saying here, when, it's, when Paul says, uh, who separated me from my mother's womb. I, I learned that this is actually a Hebrew expression, which means to sanctify, ordain, and to prepare, to set apart. And God, or, uh, God had set apart Paul unto salvation, unto the, his apostleship before he was even born. When, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, how much more grace can you see in that? That it was even before he was born that God had already chosen him. Not because of anything that he do, did, but according to the good pleasure of his will. And it pleased God, who separated him from his mother's womb. It's the same that, Jeremiah, it was, that was said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5. God says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. It was God who called. It was God who sanctified. It was God who prepared Jeremiah for the work. It was God who enabled Jeremiah to be a prophet. When God calls, he's the one that enables. And the same is, same, it is the same with everyone that believes on the name of Jesus. God calls us, 
He enables us to hear the voice of Christ. He enables us to receive even faith as a gift from God. And he's the one that keeps us. All glory and honor be to our God and Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. None of it is of us. And so it is with everyone whom he calls by name, as we read in Ephesians 1.4, as we read this morning, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So now it's even before we are formed, but even before the world was formed, God had prepared in his heart to call you by name and to save you, to choose you, that you would be holy and without blame before Christ in love, before him in love, accepted in the beloved. And so when we speak about God's sovereign grace, we can only but, all we can do is but praise and glorify the name of God. It is all of God. So God ordained where Paul would be born, who would raise him, what people he would be of, what religion he would believe, those he would be taught by, even the blind zeal he would have in persecuting the church. When we say ordained, we're not saying that it was God that tempted him, it was not God that did the evil in him, but he had permitted it. He had allowed it to come to pass. He ordained it, even before the foundation of the world. And his purpose In all of Paul's life, God was over that. He was sovereign over that. He ordained it. Even in the persecuting of Paul's persecuting the church, God ordained that. It is by no mistake that Paul would have such a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament and the law, and that he would have such an understanding of the Jews' religion. And and yes, we we see in Philippians uh, 3 that Paul... He's, though he had all those things he could boast in, he says, I count those but uh, loss and but dung. He said, I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So all those things were vain. They were profitless to him. He set them aside and he counts them but dung. They do not profit him in any way, any spiritual way of pleasing God. But yet God was over all those things in the way that he was raised and the things that he learned. But after Paul was enlightened by the Holy Spirit, he was able to see the error of his ways and the vanity of his ways. And then, though, he was so wonderfully able to defend the glorious gospel of Christ. You think about God's sovereign grace over Paul and the things that he was brought up in and the things that he went after and and all of his vanity and blind zeal. God was over every part of Paul's life. And, And during... All that time before he came to know Jesus, Paul was using it for evil. It was for evil. But yet when he was saved, now God is using it for good in Paul's life. The ability for Paul to to expose these false teachers and expose this false doctrine is because he had once boasted in these things. He had once had confidence in, in his flesh even more than these. He understood what they were saying. He understood that it was false. And so God was sovereign even over all of his vain pursuits. And now that he's enlightened by the Holy Spirit, he is able to defend the gospel, the true and the pure gospel of Christ. So we thank God that he was separated from his mother's womb and he was called by his grace. God was over his whole life. And we praise God for using even those things that he used for vain and for evil, that God used it for so much good, even for us today to see these things and to have these things exposed And so we praise God for that. Paul knew that those things he had once once held so dearly to were vanity and and dung, and he was able to refute and expose any who would try to add those things to the blessed truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we can truly see in the conversion of Paul that he was called by God's sovereign grace. He was called by his grace, and he was called according to the good pleasure of his will, as we see in Ephesians 1. And it was all to the praise and the glory of his grace who made Paul and all those, every one of us that believe in Jesus, made all of us accepted in the beloved. And it's all for the praise and the glory of of his grace. And the verse that we sung this morning, Daniel 4.35, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will. In the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Although there were many that opposed Paul in his apostleship and tried to oppose God and God's calling of Paul in his apostleship, God doeth according to his will. 
It was God who called Paul by his grace. It was God who enabled Paul by his grace. It was God that used Paul. And so all the glory went to God, and Paul knew that. But who can say unto the Almighty, what doest thou? And the purpose of this we see in verse 16 was to reveal his son in him. Paul says, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. This revealing of his son is in Paul. This is an inward revealing. It's the revealing of God's son in the inward man. As Paul's eyes were blinded when he came to see Jesus Christ, he didn't see him with his physical eyes. The light was too blind, but guess what? He saw him with the eyes of his heart. His heart was open to the glory of Jesus Christ, to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God, or, uh, Paul thought he knew God, but he had absolutely no idea who, who God was until that day Jesus Christ revealed to him who God was. And so this is an inward knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just an outward knowledge. Those that were teaching these false doctrines did actually had the name of Jesus on their tongue, and yet they were perverting his gospel. Same thing with Paul before he was saved. He, not, he didn't name the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet he thought he was serving God, but he blasphemed the name of God. So when God comes to the sinner, he does it inwardly. He reveals to him Jesus Christ inwardly. This is the new birth where God opens the eyes of their heart to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Those that know the Lord know him inwardly and intimately. This is the inward knowledge of, the, of God Almighty, to know him intimately, to know him inwardly. And so one that is converted, one that is saved, knows the Lord. They all will know the Lord. As we see in the New Covenant, the eyes of the heart are open to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, as we have said. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, when Paul is speaking about this, the power of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ, he says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul was not ashamed of the power of of the power of the gospel because he had received it himself and it had changed him. It enabled him to see who God is and to know who God is. And it's even more powerful than when God said, let there be light and there was light and the light shined out of darkness. In our hearts, in the darkness, and the blindness of our heart, God speaks his word to us and he calls us effectually and then our eyes of the heart are open to see him and to know him. That's, there's even more power in the conversion of the soul than it was when God created the heavens and the earth. It took his son to lay down his life and to cry out to his father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he bore the wrath that we all deserve. What power there is in the gospel. And we'll continue with this, but there was an inward revealing to Paul so that, he, there, would, so that there would be an outward revealing. All those that have had this inward revealing in themselves cannot help but to reveal who God is in their life and, in Paul's case, in, in his preaching. 